All right, we'll do a very significant delay. Uh, let's see, correlation of nearest neighbor is today. Uh, project is due on Friday. Uh, hopefully you didn't forget. Uh, and the course system application is also still up. If you're interested, I do plan to post it to Piazza. I just haven't gotten to it because I was busily trying to write a script that would multi-post Piazza um, and I keep getting distracted by work. So yeah. Uh, so, starting off, today we will be talking about prediction, and uh, which is where we start, I think, getting into some of the really interesting stuff in data science. Um, you know, mostly we've been working on kind of mechanics thus far, uh, and now we're going to move into what can we do with it. <clears throat> so, what do we mean by prediction? Well, usually we mean guessing the future, uh, and obviously, the, if the information is complete, we don't need to guess, right? If we already know what the answer is, then there's no reason to uh, have to predict anything. So what we're trying to do is predict an outcome for an individual, okay? And those are both kind of keywords that are important, uh, and, uh, but I think we've talked about both of them before. Um, and so one way we can approach that is to find others who are like that individual and whose outcomes we already know and then be able to make a prediction by saying, okay, um, you know, this person fits into this category of people who we know the outcome for. Uh, and so then we can use that to model a new, uh, a new prediction. So let's move to an example. And so, <clears throat> As you may have seen, if you pulled up the uh, class version of this, uh, the first two um, cells, the second cell is just a bunch of methods that likely you could have written yourself. Um, there may be a couple of features in there that we haven't used so far in this class. If we haven't used them, you don't need to know them. Um, or we will learn them one of the two. Uh, and that's, so it's just helper functions that you can, you know, take advantage of if you like. So, first we're going to talk about this Galton data, which I believe we've talked about before. And so basically one of the things that we look at is, or we could look at, right, is looking at the average between the heights of the parents of a child and looking at the, then the height of the child, right? Is that, can we make any sort of predictions about that? Um, and we talked about some problems with doing this. Uh, but for the sake of this uh, exercise, let's ignore the problems uh, because what we're trying to do is figure out how the method works, not so much whether the input data is good. Uh, and so here's just a reminder, we're just going to pull out two of the columns, the mid-parent height and the child height. And so first question is, uh, so we want to take a look at what that data looks like. What's the, what's the relationship there? So what would be one of the best ways to look at these two sets of data uh, in a graphical form to try to get an idea of how the relationships are? Any ideas? Sorry, do you have an answer back there? Yeah, you kind of had your hand up. Um, anybody else? What might we use to look at the relationship between these two uh, types of data, the mid-parent height and the... A scatter, yeah. So a scatter plot. All right. And so we're going to tell we want the scatter, we want the mid parent on the uh, x axis and the child height on the y axis. And if you look at this, <coughs> does anybody notice anything about this data? You see anything in there that uh, is kind of not pure kind of randomness. Any ideas? Do you have an answer? You follow the X to the Y. So, you know, like if we're at this 66, right, we go up here and we see it goes to this one and this one. Uh, but really, we're not, that's not really our objective, right? I'm not, 
generally speaking, when I'm looking at a scatter, looking for individual points, unless it's a really sparse one, what I'm more looking for is what does this blob look like? Okay, that's what's interesting here. Does anybody notice anything about this blob that is, so if you, if you expect it to be completely random, what should the blob look like? A circle, right? So it should be really round. And if you notice, this isn't really round, right? It kind of goes like this, right? So, or another word for it, if you're, particularly if you're an American, American football. It looks kind of like an American football. Um, so what that means is maybe there's a relationship there. And that's what we're going to kind of explore for a bit. So what we might want to look at is, okay, so we're going to try to do this prediction. My mouse keeps being in the wrong place, sorry. Uh, we're going to try to do this prediction thing. So we want to look at, we take a mid-parent height, right? And we want to kind of look at, like, let's say, a range here. This is two inches. And if we look in here, right, this set of children all came from this height parents, right? So we notice that not very many of them, there's a couple, but not very many of them are below 60 inches and not very many of them are above 70 inches. So, <coughs> excuse me, we have a good idea that if the height is, you know, the mid-parent height is between 66 and 68 inches, it's probably between 60 and 70 inches that the child will be, okay? So what we can do is we can get a little more sophisticated with that and actually let's make it a tighter band though. And so if we wanted to do, let me see what my example is again. Uh, if we wanted to say, let's look at an inch around the mid-parent height, what could we put in for these values to try to get a window that's smaller than the two inch example I gave? We want to do only an inch. So what we use on the left side and the right side? All right. So what we can do is we can take the height minus 0 0.5, right? And the height plus 0 0.5. And that will give us an inch on either side, right? Because you just subtract half an inch and add half an inch. And then that's how we're going to get this group of close points. So basically that window there. And then what we can do is we can get the average height of all the children in that window. And theoretically, that might tell us about future children. Or we can have a typo. Just in a print. All right. So let's do, I'm just going to fill this in. Let's now apply our function here, basically predicting a child and create a new column of just the predictions in the same table. So now we can see, and actually let me just print it. There we go. Okay, so now we can see we have the mid-parent height and we have the child height. And then using the average around the mid-parent of child heights, we can predict that, you know, some other kid of this mid of this set of parents is going to be about 70 inches tall on average, right? So instead of that, why don't we graph that so that we can see something a little nicer. And we can do a scatter plot again, except this time we're going to put all three pieces of data in here. I don't know how well you can tell from uh, in the back, whatever, but these yellow, this yellow thing is a bunch of dots, right? So this is all the average heights. So, you know, if you take 66 again, and you said 65 and a half inches tall to 66 and a half inches tall, you take these. So I think, can I have a graph? I might have a picture that shows this better coming up. No, not yet. But if so, if we take those and we can see that there's maybe some sort of relationship here, right? And so we notice that our football here goes kind of like this, 
Okay, and then we're starting to get maybe some sort of a line that goes across as well. Yeah. Out of curiosity, why are there three colors for the dog? Why don't we do a three instead of the same three? There's only two colors of dots. They're blue and yellow. It's just, uh, it's a trick of the, yeah, it's a trick of the, the thing. We know there's only three columns, right? So we have one column, one column, one column. So we have three columns. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit arbitrary. I mean, it would also, like, if I average it out, I could also do it with, you know, two inches on either side, right? It'll still average out to be the same. What we want is a small enough window that the prediction is going to be as close as possible, right? But we want a big enough window that we have enough data points to be able to make predictions. Make sense? So it's a little bit arbitrary. You gotta, it's a bit of a feel. Um, and probably we'll get to in this lecture, we're going to talk about how do we check the error. And so therefore, once we know what the error is, then we can say, oh, maybe we should make it a little bigger, maybe we should make it a little smaller, and we can kind of compare the errors. Any other questions? All right. I will go back to the slides in theory. Really doesn't want to switch tabs for me today. All right, and so what we call this is an association, right? And we've talked about that a bunch before, but here we have a question. So, and this is from the reading, but what type of association does a correlation measure? A nonlinear association, a linear association, or a quadratic association? All right, get those answers in. All right, I'm going to call it. So almost everybody said linear, and linear is the correct answer. And we will talk about the rest of them in a bit. Uh, but actually, we're talking about linear and nonlinear right now. So two numerical variables can have a positive association or a negative association. And this doesn't mean like it's good or bad. It just means that one is that the numbers are going up and one is that the numbers are going down. Um, and we'll show some examples in a minute. Um, and a pattern is any discernible shape in a scatter plot. Uh, and so that's one of the things we wanna look for. So if it's, as you, somebody over here kind of said, right? If it's perfectly round, there's probably not a lot of relationship there. But if we're seeing a football that kind of is shaped, you know, going up like this, that would be a positive association. And if we see one that's kind of going down, that's a negative association. So as one, you know, basically as one goes up, the other one goes down. Um, and so most of what we're going to talk about for now is linear relationships. And um, anybody know why we might want to talk about linear relationships versus nonlinear? Mostly just because they're really common and they're relatively easy to apply various functions to. So there's lots of different tools we have with linear relationships, whereas nonlinear relationships get more complicated, as you might imagine. So one of the things I like to clarify here is when we say linear, what we mean is a straight line, okay? Even though if you think about like a curve, right, that's a line too in the colloquial sense. But when we talk about it in terms of like mathematics or computer science or whatever, what we mean is a straight line, okay? So that's what we mean by linear versus nonlinear, which is like a curve or a wave or something like that is nonlinear. And we just kind of have those two big categories, mostly because linear are, are relatively straightforward 
and nonlinear get much more specific depending on the type of nonlinear they are. Um, and then, so as we often do, right, is that it's often easier to solve a lot of these types of problems if we kind of make some sort of picture and use, you know, kind of use our eyeballs to get a, a sense of the data. And then we actually try to quantify the result. And now we'll show a demo of that. So we're going to look for now at another table, uh, which is this table of hybrid cars. Okay. So what we have is basically a vehicle name. Okay. Uh, the year it was introduced, like as in the first time you could buy one of them. Then the MSRP, which is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. Okay. So it's a good comparison number for the price of cars but it's rarely the price that anybody actually pays, okay? Um, then you have the acceleration, which in this case is, uh, you know, like higher is more acceleration. It doesn't really matter in much more detail what it represents. Um, and so when we say acceleration on a car, we mean how fast does it get from zero to some speed, okay? Um, and miles per gallon, so that's how many gallons of fuel does it use uh, for every mile that it travels. And then this is the class of car, uh, which, you know, is probably pretty self-evident. So that's what this data set is. But let's take a look at the cars in terms of price. Okay. So um, we're going to look at it from highest to cheapest. So this Lexus here is $118,000, which seems like a lot for a car to me. I don't know. I like public transit. Um, but what I want to point out here is I think is kind of interesting is that does anybody notice anything about the relationship between the price of the car and the miles per gallon on the car? If you look there, you can kind of see, you know, the, the price, you know, it's uh, whatever, 118,000 is 20 months, miles per gallon, 22 on this 104. And as we go down, you know, they are all kind of in that 20, not quite, but 20 to 25 range. They're actually 20, 22. And then we have this outlier that's 25. But if we look up here where the data is a little bit more random, we can kind of see, okay, here's a $25,000 car that gets 41 miles per gallon. Does anybody think there's anything odd about that? So larger cars or more expensive cars tend to have worse miles per gallon. Um, but like this minivan, right, which is quite a big car, but relatively inexpensive at just shy of $40,000, still gets 40 miles per gallon, right? So I think largeness of car is part of it. I think acceleration is probably also part of it. So if you have a higher acceleration and a heavier car, you're going to use miles, more miles, or you're going to have lower miles per gallon, right? You're going to use more gas per mile. Um, so high acceleration compared to this minivan, right? This is an eight, and that's a 17. So what we can do, if we're not seeing those directly in the numbers, is we can try to lay it out, okay? So as you can see, there does seem to be some sort of relationship here, except it may not be linear, right? because it kind of looks like it's almost like a curve, but we'll see, I think. We're certainly talk about it some more. But then we can look at the acceleration of the MSRP as well. And as you can see, it looks a lot like this is another one of those footballs, right? Where as the acceleration goes up, so does the price of the car, right? As you can see, there's kind of, looks kind of like maybe there's a line going through here. So to reduce the problem you brought up of the weight of the car, what if we take just the SUVs, okay? So uh, SUV, the improperly named sport utility vehicle. Um, I still don't understand. I think it was supposed to, I think it's a marketing term basically because it doesn't really indicate very much about the style of car. 
but you know, if you're unfamiliar with them, relatively big, usually four door, um, often based on a truck frame, so they don't get real good gas mileage. Um, but so we have 39 of them in this data set. So why don't we look at them and the acceleration MSRP. And so this is where we get into some of that modeling stuff that we were talking about before. It looks like it still stays true. So if we kind of pull out that variable of the weight, it still seems like the acceleration goes up as you pay more, right? But then, let's see how the miles per gallon does. This one's a little bit harder to see, but there does seem to be maybe a downward trend here, right? Where um, as you pay less, you get higher miles per gallon. So this would be more, you know, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but like, you know, if we kind of pretend there's an actual line through here, then that looks like there is a negative association. Okay, as the line goes down. However, in order to solve many of these types of problems, we're going to use a, a particular technique called nearest neighbor. But in order to do that, it's much, it works much better if we do it with standard units. So the first thing we're going to do is create a little method that will calculate standard units. Does anybody remember how to calculate standard units? Like what the formula is? All right, we're having a straightforward day today. So let's see. So we're going to say x, which is our inbound, and then we're going to subtract the average of x. Nope, of x, and divide that by the standard deviation of x. And I think my parens are all kinds messed up. Spacing's not great either. All right, so now we have this little function that will take um, our array and convert it to standard units. So now we can do that with the SUV table on our miles per gallon and our MSRP and compare those two things, but in standard units. So now we can see them kind of, here's our, our new scatter plot, but we shifted it so that it's all around zero and all around zero which will simplify many of our operations later. Okay, then we can do one more. Um, and this would be the acceleration and the MSRP, getting those to standard units and just, again, distributing them around the zero here uh, so that it's easier to calculate from as we try to do some of these techniques. So, and the big one we want to look at is a way to measure what that linear association is. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, for something as varied as the amount of time it takes, what would you say is the thing that is the most Totally case by case basis and depending on what you want to know, right? So looking at acceleration MSRP, you know, what I do will be like run a bunch of scatter plots and kind of look at, okay, you know, is there a relationship between these things? Um, or more simply, I can actually use this technique, which is called the correlation coefficient, which is uh, usually just shortened to R, okay? Um, uh, but notice I have the R in italics, right, to indicate that it's a variable. Um, and so the R, because we're using standard units, will be between negative, excuse me, will be between negative one and one. And so a one, so the R is a one, it'll be a perfect straight line sloping up. Okay, so like this. And if R is negative one, it'll be a perfect straight line going down. And if it's zero, it means that there, it's a straight line. Okay, and there's no correlation. So if you imagine the graphics before, if we have the like, you know, perfect circle, that's basically a zero, you know, and if we have the football that kind of points up, 
then it's going to be close to a 1. And if we flip all the points down, that's going to be closer to a negative 1. So these are important because if you, you know, you want to be able to recognize what direction they are based on what the R is, and that will tell you whether it's a positive or a negative correlation, or if there's a correlation at all. <clears throat> so this gets us to one number that kind of helps you solve the problem. All right. So going back to this, sorry. So we have a few examples. Um, so I think, let me just see how I did this. Yeah, so basically I just wrote a method up at the top uh, that will actually visualize the scatter of the various R values. And so you can kind of just type it in. So if we get a negative one, as I said, right, it's a perfect line down. And the same is true for the positive one except going up, and then a zero is, you know, nearly a perfect circle. This is using um, some randomness in the numbers, so it's not going to be always perfect, but it should be close. But then this is where it gets, I think, a little more interesting because it's a little bit more like the real world. So this is a negative 0 0.2. So there's not a lot of correlation, right, because it's still pretty close to zero, but you can see it's, it's a little bit negative. Right? And then kind of the same is true, except for a slightly bigger version is going to be a positive correlation. Um, and this one closer to being a, a straight line, but it's definitely much more clearly going to be a positive correlation there. And then we go back to the slides. I didn't realize there was so much jumping between slides and demo today, but here it is. All right, so how do we figure out what the R is? It's the average of the product of X in standard units and Y in standard units. And then, because what you do when you read math, right, is the steps start at the right end of the sentence and go to the left, okay? So the first thing you do is get Y in standard units, then you take X in standard units, then you multiply them together, okay? Or I'll multiply the standard deviation, sorry, of the X and Y and then the average of the product of those numbers. So, because you've got a whole set, right? So that measures how clustered the scatter is around a straight line. And we will show you the math for that because it'll be simpler, at least I think it is. So first thing we're gonna do here is just make a table with uh, some kind of arbitrary numbers. They're not that arbitrary because I want to show something specific, but you know, it's just two tables with an X and a Y, or sorry, two columns with X and Y. And we want to visualize that. And so we end up with this scatter plot. Um, there's not a whole lot of data here, right? So it's a little hard to see if there's any footballs or anything else. Um, so, but instead, or as well, we can just calculate it. So that's okay. So let's shift it to standard units first and we'll throw it on the same table by just call, uh, calling that same method above. Then we're gonna do the product, except we gotta do the calc here. So for this, we're gonna just take our columns and we just call it T, right? So we can say column, but we don't need the names. We can just say column two and multiply that by no, how about multiply that by column three. And we'll end up, oops, I knew there was something wrong with it. Oh, print. Now we just have a new column. And obviously I'm just doing these step by step by step so you can see how it works. Uh, when you're, you know, kind of using R later, you can kind of crash all this into one step. But so the first thing we get our x's and y's, then we convert them to standard units, and then we take the product of the two sets of standard units. Then, as we've done before, we're just going to take 
the let's do the mean of the two products. Three. And so now we have an R, right? So this was the last one I demoed in the R scatter, right? Is that it's a positive correlation and kind of a football going up, except it's relatively tight because it's pretty close, or it's not real close, but it's getting to close to one. And now we can actually just shift that to being a function so that we can just do our correlation as one method. So now we have, you know, whatever you pass in, you pass in the table and then the positions uh, and then it's going to calculate it out for you. So now we can get the same number by just passing into our nice little method. Um, the reason I point out this method a bunch is that, you know, cutting and pasting it from this and throwing it in your notes somewhere can be really handy later because correlation is a very common thing to want to calculate. And so that's my knowledge is it's not built in anywhere. Um, so now we can figure out, is there actually a correlation between our miles per gallon and our MSRP? And remember, we're not saying anything about causal, right? Just that there's a relationship between these two things. So it looks like that there's a pretty strong negative correlation here. So, you know, negative 0.6, so that football going down, between the miles per gallon and the uh, manufacturer, manufacturer suggested retail price. Easy for me to say. Uh, so basically, you know, as it gets more expensive, the miles per gallon get worse. So then we can also look at the correlation with the acceleration and the MSRP, and that seems to have a positive correlation, right? Somewhat less than the correlation between the miles per gallon and the MSRP, um, but as you can see, right, this would be a handy thing to kind of run against all of the columns on a data set if you wanted to see if there was any relationships between the different columns in the data set. Because it's relatively straightforward and cheap to figure it out. One thing we'd like to point out is that you can also switch the axes. Ah, sorry. Um, and let me see. So between the X and the Y, right, it's the same correlation. And we can scatter it out, but we just switch the X and the Y. And so it doesn't really matter which approach you're going from because the correlation will still be the same. Does that make sense? So, so even though the relationship is kind of inverted, the, um, like it still holds, right? There's still a correlation which maybe is obvious to everyone, but I like to point it out because I'm not sure it was obvious to me. So, all right. All right, however, and here's where st we start to get into some of the caveats. We need to be careful of false conclusions of causation. Okay, as I pointed out before, just because we see one of these linear relationships doesn't mean it's causal. It might also be causal, causal but this isn't proof of that. Nonlinearity, so in other words, thinking something is linear and it's not uh, is a very easy mistake to make. Um, outliers can also throw off this data as we keep talking about, right? If you have a bunch of you know random points on your scatter plot that don't that don't fit, it can really throw things off. And then ecological correlations, which I will explain by demo rather than out loud, or at least immediately. So, let me catch up with my cheat sheets. So the first thing I wanna look at is nonlinear. So, and the reason we bring this up is because these two, these X's and the Y's, right? They make this nice pattern here. There is a relationship there. It's just not a linear one. So the rules that we've been looking at won't work on this data set. Does that make sense? So there is an association, it's just not a linear one. And so if you try to use it, it's not gonna work right, okay? 
So this, in this case, right, this does not mean there's no relationship. It just doesn't mean, it just means that it's not a linear one. Um, and I think we talk about a good example of that in a little bit. And then outliers, I think we've seen these before. Um, but where is the outlier? Is what? Uh, I don't know. All right, so this one is a. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I forgot what my slide looked like here. Okay, so this is a perfect line. So, in other words, it has a correlation of one. So, there are no outliers here, but with nearly the same data set, but we introduce one more point. So, we introduce this five zero at the end there, which is that red dot down here. Now we try to run a correlation on that and it just kind of completely blows it up, right? So you gotta be really careful about outliers. Basically, it's kind of, uh, generally speaking, it's like if you, if you have, it's the number of outliers kind of in relationship to your main data. So in other words, we only have five points here and one of them is an outlier, it's gonna have a pretty big impact. Whereas if we had 2000 data points and we had one outlier, it's probably not. That makes sense? All right, so this is where we talk about ecological correlations and this is basically like um, other things in play, okay? So this is, um, does everybody here know what the SAT is? Like I assume everybody at least just took a pass at it at some point, I don't know, most of you probably got lucky and didn't have to actually take it because it was college, uh, given COVID. Um, but this is SAT scores. Um, I, I have a hard time reading them anymore because as far as I like as far as I can tell uh, SAT grading has like changed every I don't know every six months I don't know when I took it there was only two numbers they were both out of 800 it's been a lot different since then so participation rate so Alabama 6.7 participation rate so very very small right their critical reading scores are math writing and combined scores so you look at this data and you say hey maybe we can make some predictions about, say, a scatter relationship between critical reading and math, okay? So as you may expect, I don't know, um, this looks like a pretty strong correlation between having a high reading score and having a high math score, right? Because it's definitely doing that up into the right thing. The thing is, and we get a correlation of 0.9, like it's nearly one, that's really good. However, because this data is lying to us, okay? Because of things like very small participation rates. So therefore, uh, we're, this data here is maybe not representative of what people in Alabama actually do. Or maybe there's just, they just happen to be near each other. They're not actually related. There's no association there. They just happen to work that way because of other kind of environmental or ecological considerations. Yeah. Of the, of the eligible, right? Like, you know, there's not a lot of retirees who are taking the SAT. They're not counted either. Um, this is 6.7% of, let's say, 18 year olds took SA, the SAT in Alabama in 2014. Um, so so there's, there's basically this, this other data element that may be throwing off any kind of conclusions that we could make here. So for example, if we took this, you know, this uh, association, we tried to make a prediction and we did it in Alabama, it might be wildly wrong because our data set is actually really small. For, for Alabama, right? So we don't, we don't have a good idea of what's going on here because not all of these rows are really comparable. For, and then on top of that, it's also not representing the wildly different sizes of like California and the District of Columbia, right? Because California has, I don't know how many millions of people. District of Columbia, I think, has probably about a million. So you've got to consider where, you know, kind of the context of your data 
before you start to draw conclusions um, that seem really obvious, but may not actually be. And this actually comes from a real case that I'll try to remember to dig up for, for next, next time, um, but I can't remember the details of at the moment. So, here are some pretty pictures. All right, so if you look at these two, ah, it's fuzzy, um, which is higher value of R? Should be this graph or this graph, and I think the way I set it up is you touch the one that you think is the higher one. And assuming that my drawing also reflects where you touch it. Oh, and one thing I like to clarify about the, is this question, and we have a couple more of them. So when I say highest value, right, not the highest, like, number, but the highest number on the number range. So if it's negative, then it's going to be lower than a higher number. Because that is definitely a trap I would fall for. All right, get those answers in. Pick one. Do we have a lot of ghosts today? All right. That's hilarious about the heat map, though. Okay, so the correct answer is the right hand side. Okay, and oh, that's kind of annoying. Um, so you can't, you can't really see it now. Um, but does anybody have a guess as to what, about the, what you think this correlation might be? Like just ballpark? 0.4 that's a little low, it's probably a little higher. Um, all right, so I think this was about a 0. 0.6, and this is about a 0. 0.1. Like, I don't know, one of them. <laughs> like, either one would probably result in something that looked pretty close to that, right? All right, got a couple more of them for you. All right, so which one has the higher value of R? I am talking about on the number line. Uh, I'm talking about on the number line. So yeah, at least I trapped at least one other person in the trap I would have fallen into. <laughs> All right, get those answers in. <coughs> All right, I'm calling it. Maybe. Sorry. <sighs> All right, so why is the left picture incorrect? Why is this one incorrect? To your earlier point, right? We're not talking about the absolute value here. We're talking about the actual number. So, because this is so sharply down, it's a, a, it's a more negative number than this one, which is down but but less so, right? All right, another one. Let's see, what we got. They start getting trickier.
Can I get those answers in? Last chance. All right. Anybody have any theories, even though this looked pretty close? Why do you think this one is right and that one's not? Yes, exactly. So these nasty buggers over here are throwing off your overall correlation. I don't know, because I don't remember what the numbers actually were. Um, but it would, I don't think it's actually going to be that far, because there's actually quite a lot of points in here. Um, so it's still it's still close-ish. So this wouldn't be completely skew our bounds. It would just right. skew them only so much. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the little can mean a lot, though, if you know what I mean. OK, one more. I think that's it. Uh, did I? Yeah, okay, it's open. And remember, we're looking for the highest number on the number line, right? Not absolute value. All right, get those final answers in. Only two more people. Let's see if they're ghosts. All right, last chance. All right. All right, so anybody have a theory about why the, the right one is correct? We're going to be explaining why the right one is correct over the left one. Okay, so this is downward overall trend, but what about all these outliers, though? They're still kind of located uh, in line with the theory of the best decision. Okay, that's just a one argument. I think there's a better argument. Anybody else? Getting there, getting there. Any other theories? I think the second one is probably the most in alignment with the uh, first one. But then if we're adding outliers to that, it just skews the entire theory. Yeah. What else you got? Um, yeah, so, so this is actually closer to zero, OK? And these outliers are kind of throwing, or meant to throw you off. But if you notice, they're actually relatively in balance with each other. So it's actually kind of keeping it still near zero. So I don't know. There's a lot of different explanations. Um, you know, if you if you went through all of the math, maybe you could figure it out. But I guess from a looking at a perspective, this is kind of the reason I use this as an example is that outliers don't always have a huge effect if they're balanced, right? So you just got to be careful when you're, you know, when you're trying to figure out R based on you know, looking at it, which is probably not always the best idea, but if you are, just kind of keep in mind, there's all these different variables that you should be considering. Where are the outliers? Do they balance? You know, what direction does the trend look like, et cetera, et cetera. You know, obviously calculating it is easier, um, but that's kind of the idea. If you get used to it, it helps. All right, so here is a random example that I was tempted to cut, but I find it very funny. So. Um, speaking of another ecological example, so I don't know how well you can read this, um, but there appears to be a correlation between chocolate consumption and Nobel Prize winning, okay? So the more chocolate that is consumed by a country, the more Nobel Prizes they win, okay? So as you can tell, they actually have like a p-value and an r-value for this 
correlation, okay? However, it's kind of hard to say whether there's really a relationship here. I will also point out that this um, uh, graph was produced by the Swiss, who may or may not have a bias, but long story short, um, watch, watch your graphs, right? Like, take a look at what you're trying to say, what you think you're implying, and making sure that what you're saying is the truth, or what you know, as close to the truth as you can possibly get. Um, however, I also encourage high chocolate consumption because you will definitely win a Nobel Prize as a result. All right, so going back to prediction, and of course my, probably not the first bad joke of the day, who here was surprised that we were talking about prediction? No, really, nobody? Come on. You couldn't predict that we, we were gonna talk about prediction? Uh, okay, so here's our Galton's Heights. Um, and so what we wanna do is what we demonstrated a little bit before, except a little bit more formally. So we can see that it is kind of oval shaped, right? Um, so there's probably a moderate positive correlation, but it's not huge, right? Because it's still pretty circular. And so how can we predict those heights? What we do is we take a little window, right? And in this case, we did an inch around uh, the mid-parent height. And then we average out the children's heights in the middle. I'm pointing at the yellow dots. I'm not sure if you can see it, but that's the average. So then what we do is we do them all, right? So we do a bunch of predictions. And as you can see, what is that starting to look like, right? In tint. That was more of a rhetorical question. Um, but what we end up with is, I feel like I missed a jumping back to the code for a second, but. This is called nearest neighbor regression. And so it's a method for prediction. And we group each X with similar or nearby X values. And we average the corresponding Y values for that group. And then for each X value, the prediction is the average of the Y values in its nearby group. And the graph of these predictions is referred to as the graph of averages. And if the association between X and Y is linear, then points in the graph of averages tend to fall on a line. That makes sense to everybody? So basically, when we look at this, right, we can calculate a line that goes through here. So now we know kind of where, if we have the parent height, we can make any prediction here for the child height because we don't have to just rely on these yellow dots. We can actually run a line through it. And this may seem obvious, um, but we've got math that will do it, right? All right, so another question. Oh, no, uh, never mind. It's the demo in a second. So, yeah. I feel like this slide is out of order. Um, no, so this is unrelated R. I feel like it's out of order. That's why I think I'll just skip it for now. Um, but we will talk about doing the graph. I don't know why. So we can talk about prediction lines quickly because we only have 15 minutes left. But so let's make another table. Um, and we have another method here, the R table, which will basically generate a bunch of data that will end up in a correlation of 0 0.99, okay? And so then we can see a scatter plot of it and it should look like what we expect. I don't know why I had it twice. But yep, I just had it twice. All right, oh, sorry. All right, so, now this time, as I was kind of saying before, is that the windows that we choose are somewhat arbitrary, right? They're based on the data itself, okay? But now we're using standard units, so it's gonna have to be quite a bit smaller 
than the numbers we were using before. So we're going to use uh, basically 0.5. So we're going to say x val here. Nope, val minus, and we're actually going to use 0 0.25, right? Because it's half. And then x val plus 0 0.25. And probably missing a print. All right. So using our kind of little arbitrary data set here, we can now predict for negative 2.25. So here-ish that what the value will be on the y-axis. And that looks like it's going to be negative 2.14, so about here, give or take-ish. Seems a little high, but I believe you. So then using the apply function again, and this is, this apply function is important. You know, you're going you're gonna to need it, so just kind of get used to using it. And so now we're going to apply our new little method there to uh, create a new uh, column of Y's. And now we have all of our predicted Y's, which are this yellow set of dots on the blue dots. But now we can draw a line based on the data that we have. So in this case, it's a very simple case, right? It's nearly 0 0.99, right? So we can actually draw a line of slope one and we'll actually get really close because it's, the correlation was 0 0.99, right? So, but if we try and do the same thing with a correlation of zero, that gets less useful. Why is this taking so long? All right, so there's our predicted values, right? So they're just kind of in the middle, right? We don't, we're not seeing a whole lot uh, that we can actually use based on this nearest neighbor technique <coughs> because there's no correlation. So we end up with a line that just kind of runs through the middle. And then kind of the last example here, this is something a little, uh, So this is pretty clearly our football kind of going up, but we can do the same thing and get to our line prediction. But let me see. But this is where we start to notice that it falls apart to just kind of choose our vertical lines, right? Instead of using, instead of guessing, that we think it's going to be 1.5. I don't know why I don't have this yellow one first here. Um, but you can see this red line here, that's not great, right? It's not really mapping to our predicted values. So this is probably not going to give us the values we want. So instead, we need to actually calculate what to do there. So how might we do that? Sorry, let me catch up on my cheat sheet so I can cut and paste or whatever. Um, so we might want to have a line that is closer to that. And we can kind of say, okay, let's do 0 0.5, but with an intercept, oops. Why is this happening? So, sorry. So we can get closer to the to the line, right? Our original guess was we're just kind of straight up and through, and we can just kind of still make better predictions along these lines. Um, and we'll talk more about. I think it's maybe a little bit on the next slide, um, but we'll talk more about like how we can create those lines 
uh, you know, basically how can we make the predictive line so we can use that to predict things about unknown data. Let me switch. Yeah, it's, uh, we're gonna talk about it next time uh, where we start to get um, the, uh, how do we calculate those, those slope signs? We can actually get a regression and then we can just kind of say, hey, now I just figure out what the calculation is and I can just make a prediction, which makes it a lot simpler. Um, and then hopefully we'll get to some of the more advanced uh, techniques for that uh, in the next couple lectures before we get to the end of the semester. Any other questions?